Hello, I'm James Holland and I'm a historian of the Second World War. History Hit is a bit like Netflix, but purely for history. And we've got hundreds of hours of historical documentaries going all the way back to classical times, right through to the Cold War and beyond. Use the word war stories, all one word, for a massive discount when you join up. The untold story of war production. All wars are about competition in production. The side that can produce more is always going to triumph over the other side. This is a war between the factories. The real story of how the world wars were fought and won. It may sound strange, but modern wars, they're not won by battles, they're won by factories. They swamped the other side with a tide of mass production. And those factories would shape the modern world. Volkswagen, Fiat, Mitsubishi, they're all household names now, but they made those names as war factories. Gotta get back to work. This is the story of a dynasty and of the factory they created. It was five stories high, and as you went up the building, the car got put together. But this dynasty didn't just make cars. They made trains. The Littorina revolutionized the railway industry. They made planes. The G50 Freccia was Italy's best interceptor. And like modern-day kingmakers, they made and broke governments. Mussolini needed Agnelli, and Agnelli needed Mussolini. This is the story of the Agnelli family, founding fathers of the Italian auto industry and of the factory they created. This is the story of Fiat. On the 28th of October, 1922, the black shirts of Benito Mussolini's fascist party march on Rome, taking over the Italian government. The march on Rome is basically the seminal moment in Italian fascist folklore. This was presented as the victory of this unstoppable force. The fascists getting together triumphantly heading into Rome, seizing government ministries and making Mussolini dictator. They wrestle control of Italy's destiny from these lily-livered liberal elites who are dragging it down. It doesn't work like that. But that doesn't mean it's not a good story. The march is an act of pure fiction that Mussolini invents to cover up a shameless power grab. It is an early example of what Trump would call fake news. Mussolini doesn't get into power through a big march. He gets into power through a series of somewhat grubby backroom deals with the Italian establishment with a big march. That's much more heroic. The fiction is far more exciting than the reality. The march on Rome isn't a coup. It's a transfer of power with the intent of ending a decade of unrest that has been spreading like a cancer from the factories of Turin to the whole of Italy. And Mussolini does not seize that power. It is given to him by Italy's leading industrialists, who see him as a shield against that unrest. The industrialists are worried about dissension, they're worried about disruption in their factory, and they then gravitate towards Mussolini as someone who can enforce order and sort of keep things producing. And the leading figure amongst all this lot? Well, it was the founder of Fiat, Giovanni Agnelli. The story of Italy's war factories begins in the industrial city of Turin in 1899, where a 33-year-old former cavalry officer called Giovanni Agnelli is looking for a new career. Agnelli is not a rags-to-riches story. He's a cavalry officer, and he starts racing cars. What Agnelli has is a really intense interest in automobile engineering. So what he does is to set up a consortium of businessmen in Turin, and they're going to put together a car manufacturing firm. They call the company the Fabrica Italiana Automobili di Torino, 
the Italian car company of Turin, or for short, Fiat. At first, business is slow and a lot of partners lose interest. Car making is still seen as a rather precarious business. Sales are often largely for the upper classes. It's a luxury. It's not seen as, as, as something that's a, a stable industry for the future. But Agnelli is undeterred. He has vision. So by 1906, Agnelli is buying out all the shares of his fellow businessmen. And that's how Agnelli takes control. Not long afterwards, Agnelli visits the United States and meets another automobile entrepreneur, Henry Ford. When Agnelli visits Henry Ford's Highland Park plant, he sees a vision of the future. A brand new factory epitomising progress, the way forward, and it's making everyday cars. At the time, cars were painstakingly assembled by hand. It's slow and inefficient. Ford revolutionised the industry. What Ford does, essentially, is to compartmentalise things on the production line. Originally, when you manufactured a vehicle, you actually started with a team of engineers, and they would follow the vehicle through every stage of its manufacture, whether it's the chassis, the bodywork, the engine. They were all experts at what they did, able to do every single element of its manufacture, producing effectively a bespoke vehicle which had one really big advantage. The finish was superb. The problem was it's the equivalent of making an Alfa Romeo. Very, very nice vehicle, beautiful to look at, but very, very expensive. However, if you go to a production line, things change completely. Here, each element of the production is broken down into a series of stages. And at each stage, a group of relatively skilled people can do one job. And having done that one job, then they pass on to the next stage in production while they continue with the next vehicle that's coming to them. What we then get here is the next stage of assembly, which allows us now to actually put together the entire shell of the vehicle, ready for it to go on to the next stage in the production line. And when that happens, what we can then do is simply fit the final components. Here, fitting the roof, and then adding to the vehicle, the wheels. On the wheels go, and with that done, we can literally roll a finished vehicle out of the workshop while the next one in the production line comes down all the way down and each stage continues as a non-stop linear process. Ford's work quickly becomes the standard for the auto industry. Agnelli and Ford become really good friends and Agnelli even ends up having a photograph of him and Ford on his desk and he really learns from Ford. By the end of 1912, Fiat, using Ford's new method, is churning out its first mass-produced car, the Tipo Zero. It's a roaring success. The Tipo Zero is successful in the way that the Model T had been in America. It's a car that can fit lots of purposes. It's rugged, it's simple. It is the first Italian people's car. No longer is the car just the preserve of, of the idle rich. The car industry is the classic example of one of the basic truths of capitalism. The way to make seriously large amounts of money is to produce cheap mass products for the general large market. Henry Ford makes far, far more money than Henry Royce. And the same is true in Italy with Fiat. As a result, Fiat makes an absolute fortune and it makes Agnelli a very rich man indeed. Agnelli isn't just an astute businessman. He is also a canny politician. Giovanni Agnelli is remarkably adept at seeing which way the political wind is blowing, and that pays enormous dividends throughout his career. You need political assistance to run very, very large integrated firms, 
You do not want to be too highly regulated. You want regulations to uh, favour you. You also want the state to prevent smaller competitors from coming up and upsetting your dominant position. One of Agnelli's first political friends is the Liberal leader and future Prime Minister, Giovanni Giolitti. He was regarded at the time as very much as being the kind of godfather of Italian politics. Agnelli wisely befriends Giolitti. As a result, many wartime contracts at Fiat prospers hugely during the First World War. The wartime bonanza makes Fiat the largest vehicle manufacturer in Europe, and its workforce balloons from 4,000 to nearly 40,000. It's the third largest industry in Italy. But Agnelli is about to face the biggest threat yet to his thriving auto factories, one that will nearly wrest Fiat from his control. To deal with it, he seeks the help of a former socialist firebrand who acrimoniously split with the party, a young journalist called Benito Mussolini. World War I is a disaster for Italy. Its army is embarrassed, its navy ineffectual, and its military ventures become the Europe-wide butt of jokes. The inferiority complex of the Italians, that sense of national weakness, was then compounded by the way Italy was treated by the Allies. And a famous poet called Gabriele D'Annunzio called this, in a very famous phrase, a mutilated victory. Things aren't much better at home, where the pressures of wartime production has led to shortages and workers' unrest. Conditions in the factories were absolutely atrocious. Industrial accidents were really common, and the working week was incredibly long. It was 75 hours. I mean, that's almost double the normal working week in Europe today. The most disaffected workers are women. By 1917, 70% of the factory workers in Italy are women. And uh, they're not only dealing with atrocious working conditions in factories, but they're dealing with all the pressures on home life as well, such as food shortages. At the same time, the movement of socialists and radical workers' unions was constantly trying to politicise the situation in its own press and agitation. A perfect example of this happens in Turin, where there are a lot of women who are working 12-hour shifts in factories, and they get up one morning and they have 80 local bakeries have put up signs saying that there is no bread. Female workers saw that bakers continued to produce uh, luxury items for the for, uh, so-called bourgeoisie, but they were actually not able to anymore get bread. So the women get their children and they march on City Hall and they protest about it. So what you have is a bread riot, people um, protesting about a lack of flour. But then 2,000 railway workers come out in sympathy and then more workers start adding to it, including people from the Fiat factory. That escalated because there was so much socialist feeling in the air. And this led to a full-scale mini-revolution in Turin. So they're throwing handmade bombs, they're fighting with the police. Barricades, the army was sent in, people were shot at by the army. And the reaction to it is brutal. 50 workers are killed and about 800 more are uh, wounded. 1,500 male workers were actually sent to the front, which at the time was almost a death sentence because the conditions on the front were quite horrendous. So as the Great War draws to a close, Turin is a simmering pot of resentment, just waiting to explode. And in Russia, Lenin is about to light the red touch paper. The Soviet Union had successful Russian revolution. You have communist forces in Germany. You have strikes in Britain. So around Europe, the power of communism seems very much on the rise. You've got to remember, if you're an industrialist or a politician, you're looking at these strikes and these riots, and you're worried this powder keg can just turn into, into a complete revolution. And what communists do when they come to power is take over factories like those of Agnelli's. In 1919, events finally boil over, and Italy descends into an era of severe social unrest. It's called the Biennio Rosso in Italian, the red two years in which there was a, a massive wave of strikes throughout Italy, literally hundreds and hundreds of strikes. I mean, that's just crippling to the Italian economy. Eventually, the strikes come to an end, 
and Giolitti's government finally steps in. But for Agnelli, it's too little, too late. Agnelli is enraged because, as he sees it, Giolitti is just simply a laissez-faire liberal. All he's done is, is just compromise, and he hasn't sent in the troops to break the strikes. What it did underline for the industrialists was the absolute incompetence of the Giolittian government. And so Agnelli starts looking around to find another political ally. And one of those he sees is a man called Benito Mussolini. Benito Mussolini is a radical journalist who starts his career as an ardent socialist. What he does over time, though, is take on a more nationalist hue. So he takes socialism and some of the ideas of socialism, but then he, he mutates them with this form of intense Italian nationalism. When Mussolini started developing an ideology and a movement which actually believed in force and violence and confrontation, it was very easy for industrialists to switch allegiances away from liberal democracy towards this experiment in uh, a strong state. In Mussolini, Agnelli seems to find the perfect tool to secure Fiat's future. Agnelli was a pragmatist, and he saw in Mussolini a man who could help him to keep both Giolitti and the labor unions in line. Initially, the idea is to broker an alliance between Mussolini's burgeoning new fascist party and Giolitti's liberal coalition. If your goal is to take power and get your economic needs met and you're Agnelli, then yes, supporting Mussolini seems like a very smart goal. He'll work with you. But actually, you know, there's a bit more to it than that, because the problem is, once you start legitimizing this radical minority's view by bringing them into the mainstream, you're starting to make those views acceptable. But they're more than just smoke. Throughout the following year, the invigorated fascists wage a campaign of terror against the workers, breaking up strikes and crushing opposition. Whole cities fall under their control. Though Mussolini never dares to muscle in on Turin the way he does elsewhere. This is Agnelli's personal fiefdom. I think it's fair to say that Agnelli, like most industrialists, would have regarded himself as essentially apolitical or above politics. He's not an ideological animal. Agnelli never really embraced fascism totally. He is on record calling for Mussolini to end all the violence in the provinces. What Agnelli and his cronies did was to try to keep Mussolini on a short leash. This is Italy in 1922. Then, in October 1922, the leash snaps. What happens is Mussolini does give a rousing speech to the Fascist Party Conference in Naples, calling on the fascists to take power, and there are chants in the room of march on Rome, march on Rome, march on Rome. And he basically crystallizes while he's talking to these people that the next stage is going to be a sort of putsch. They're going to march on Rome. They're going to take power. They're going to show these, this ineffectual liberal government that there is this third force in Italy. Fascism has been Mussolini's dream for seven years. Empowered by Mussolini's speech, thousands of fascists start north from Naples to Rome. You've got 27,000 fascists beginning to gather at all the railway stations going into Rome. And then when it starts to rain and the trains break down, you know, all these fascists are just you know, kind of milling around gormlessly at the stations and wondering what to do. At that point, it becomes a bit of farce. Sort of Monty Python parody, because most of the black shirts never made it to Rome, and when they got there, they had no leadership to tell them really what to do, because Mussolini wasn't there himself. And there was no moment where they all got together and sort of marched on anywhere. Now, this is where it could have all ended. Just one decisive action by someone in charge could have called Mussolini's bluff and just faced him down. But what happens is that the king loses his nerve completely and he refuses to declare martial law. And instead invites Mussolini to become a head of state. So by the end of the day, the fascists are now in power. For Mussolini, the quote-unquote march becomes a key element in his mythos. A man willing to take great risks, put himself in danger, leading his fascist cadres in, in to take Rome. It isn't true, but that doesn't mean it's not a good story. And so Mussolini decides to reenact the fiction. 
And so the Italians are brought in, they march on Rome in their black shirts for the cameras to be seen and people to cheer and wave. The fiction is far more exciting than the reality. What we don't know, though, is quite where Giovanni Agnelli was throughout all this. Uh, because once the march on Rome has succeeded, where he can be seen is working behind the scenes to try and broker a liberal stroke kind of fascist coalition led by Mussolini. You know, what Agnelli said is Fiat is on the side of the government. Of course, what he left out saying is, you know, it didn't matter what that government might be. And in that sense, it's quite a, quite a successful plan for Agnelli. It's a ruthlessly pragmatic approach and will earn him huge dividends in the years and the war to come. On the 22nd of May, 1923, Giovanni Agnelli completes a brand new Fiat car factory in the suburb of Lingotto, Turin. The Lingotto factory was, was really the first modern car factory in the world. It's all about the future, harnessing um, the, the latest architecture to the latest automotive advances. I mean, it's vast, and it's actually the first factory ever built for the sole purpose of producing and testing cars. Agnelli had been toying with this idea ever since visiting Henry Ford's Model T factory. But this isn't just another production line. This is a production house. So how the factory works is as a series of vertical progressions. So the parts go in at the ground floor. Being literally funneled in on conveyor belts, uh, linked to the railway yard right next door. The assembly line winds its way up, up the various floors. So the car is gradually built as you go up the building. And then the finished cars appear on the roof and you have a wonderful test track on the roof to, to give them a spin, just to check that, that everything's in order. It's 400 metres long, and it's got these kind of parabolic ramps that are raised and curved. That means that you can really race around this roof. It can take cars travelling at 90 kilometres an hour. Virtually nothing can do that speed at the time. It's something that no one's ever built before. Lingotto symbolises the age. The age of speed. The age of modernity. The age of fascism. You have to remember that Italy was embarrassed by the Great War. It had a real inferiority complex, but fascism was giving them means of defining themselves. It was new, it was virile. It was actually making Italy great again. Following the march on Rome, Agnelli astutely repositions himself behind the rising power of Mussolini's fascist party. Mussolini's seizure of power is immensely beneficial to Agnelli. Mussolini wanted Italy to be a great power, but it didn't have the infrastructure to be a great power except for a few companies like Fiat. So Mussolini was desperate for Agnelli. He's given preferential contracts. He's made senator for life. And then when you have the Ford Motor Company trying to break into the Italian market, what does Mussolini do? Well, he passes a nice series of laws uh, which block foreign cars from being built in Italy. That obviously gives Fiat just a completely protected market. Under the fascist regime, Fiat's profits triple and its workforce doubles in strength. But the fascists have only just started. In the ultra-modern fascist future of Mussolini's Italy, Fiat's cars obviously need a road to run on, the Autostrada motorways. The creation of the Autostrada network in northern Italy, this was the first motorway in the world. What the fascisti said themselves is there was an attempt to inject the spirit of the trenches into the building of a state. That get things done spirit that had motivated the Italian army. And it was very much a reaction of the fascists against the failed modernity of liberalism and also communism. It was literally a concrete symbol of how Italy had gone from backwardness and humiliation to a, a new phase of glory. To run on these brand new auto routes, Agnelli creates one of the most iconic cars of its era, the Fiat 500 Topolino. Topolino was the Italian name for, for Mickey Mouse, and it reminded the Italian public, at least, uh, of that famous cartoon character. 
Most cars had two cylinders, this had four, and it had a pretty fast top speed. It would go at 85 kilometers an hour, and it cost less than about 10,000 lira. The Topolino quickly endears itself to the Italian people, and over half a million are made. There was nothing like it in the world. It was economical, it was fun, it was rugged, it was simple, but it was very modern. It looked to the future, not to the past. Yet Fiat and the fascists don't just limit themselves to roads. Now, the biggest cliché about Mussolini is that he's supposed to have made Italy's trains run on time. And it's a cliché because, actually, it's true. And what's less well-known is that the company behind the cliché uh, was Fiat. In 1931, Fiat builds Italy's first petrol-powered rail car. The Litterina revolutionised the railway industry because you no longer needed massive steam locomotives to drag carriages. They could actually power themselves. At 15 metres long, with 48 seats and a top speed of 110 kilometres per hour, the Fiat Litterina is another revolution in design. Until the Litterina became available, it had been the age of steam. Now, suddenly, these self-propelled trains were able to go anywhere in Italy, whether it was up a mountain in Sardinia or Sicily, but what it did do, it opened up transport for ordinary Italian people in a way that nothing had done before. In 1938, a specially designed Litterina establishes the speed record for diesel trains at 160 kilometers per hour. Fiat trains are now the leaders of the world. The Litterina was made in Italy. I mean, best of all, the aluminium that was made from, which is a modern material, was even manufactured with power generated in Italy. Under the fascists, not only does Fiat's share of the Italian car market rise to a staggering 87%, but 800 Litterinas ferry passengers the length and breadth of Italy, sometimes on lines part-owned by Fiat itself. Yet despite its obvious advantages, Agnelli's alliance with the fascists is never much more than a marriage of convenience. Agnelli joins the fascist party in 1932. That's 10 years after Mussolini's come to power. He's quite late to the party. Amongst other things, Agnelli is unconvinced by their economic policies. He's never been a great you know, vocal supporter of the fascist regime. This sentiment later proves true as Mussolini's grand schemes disguise an ailing economy, with growth half of the previous liberal era. But Agnelli's fears for his fiat factories surpass all other concerns. Agnelli is going to work, as he said, with the government. It doesn't really matter what government it is, so long as it basically helps fiat. What Agnelli is, he's a pragmatist. His attitude really seems, to many ways, have been mirrored by his workforce. In 1939, to keep up with rising demand, Agnelli opens an even larger Fiat factory in the Turin district of Mirafiori, covering an area of two million square meters with 20 kilometers of rail lines and 11 kilometers of underground roads. Fiat's latest factory is a mini city in its own right. Mussolini decides a grand ceremony will be held to mark the occasion with him, Il Duce, at the center. The Mirafiori factory opening of 1939 is yet another instance of where, so often in Mussolini's career, attempt at staging a great solemn set piece turns into farce. This is Il Duce, this is Mussolini basking in the glory and opening the biggest car factory in Europe. But there's a problem. So Mussolini goes and is greeted by uh, 50,000 workers who'd been standing in the rain for two hours with almost complete indifference. Mussolini, I suppose, to his sort of credit, he tries to work the crowd, he tries to get them going. I mean, he is a leader after all, this is what he's supposed to do. And about 400 go, eh. And Mussolini just stomps off in a, in a complete huff. More concerning in Agnelli's eyes is Mussolini's dangerous flirtation with the Nazi party of Adolf Hitler. If you're an Italian businessman in the 1930s, you have to be increasingly alarmed by the direction of Mussolini's foreign policy. 
Mussolini's fiction was that Italy was a great power ready to go to war at any time. If you were a member of Italian industry, you had a greater sense of reality that Italy was not ready. Siding with Adolf Hitler meant aligning yourself against the rich markets of Europe's leading democracies, in particular Britain and France. It is not in the interests of the Italian business community to fall out with their major source of capital out from outside Italy. It's not an ideal partnership, but ultimately it would bring down both Mussolini and Agnelli. But for this to happen, the world will have to go to war once more. World War II doesn't go any better for the Italians than World War I. Of course, in retrospect, it, it, it looks like a disaster. Mussolini, you know, hitching himself uh, to Adolf Hitler. But in 39, it felt like a masterstroke. By this point, he sort of become disillusioned with the British and the French. Whereas Hitler is saying to him, come with me, come with me, and we together will, will rule Europe. And that just becomes too intoxicating for Mussolini. Japan had seized Chinese Manchuria. Hitler had taken Czechoslovakia, she had taken Poland. Fascism is on the up. Why not ally yourself? But first impressions can be deceptive. The problem with every demagogue in history is that they start to believe their own speeches. Mussolini is one of the classic case in point, in fact, because he starts off as an actually rather pragmatic and hard-headed politician. But by the time you get to the middle of the 1930s, he clearly believes his own propaganda about founding a new Rome. And that's the fatal moment at which you have lost your perception of reality uh, and you start to make serious errors. This is thrown into stark relief in the transport sector when Agnelli's Fiat fails to provide Mussolini with the trucks he needs. The Second World War, as it develops, becomes a war of trucks. They're not sexy. People like to talk about tanks, or they like to talk about fighter aircraft. But to be perfectly honest, the Second World War is won or lost because of the allocation of trucks. You needed trucks to move supplies. Modern armies couldn't move on horse everything. They needed to have trucks. One of the reasons why Agnelli is so keen to build this factory at Mir Fiori is because he needs that capacity to supply Mussolini with all these trucks for all these sort of armed adventures, and he can't do it with his existing resources. Despite increasing supply, Italy's state-controlled economy fails to keep up with demand, and Mussolini is forced to turn to America's free enterprise. In the end, much to Agnelli's embarrassment, Mussolini turns to this consortium that is actually a front for Ford. Fiat's failure exposes a fatal flaw in Mussolini's fascist regime. The key uh, economic ideology of the fascist movement in Italy is corporatism, uh, which is the idea that you should not have the free market competition of capitalism. Instead, the whole economy is divided up into sectors, and the great problem with that is this. When you allow politicians and bureaucrats to make major economic decisions, they're guided by political concerns, which are often short term, which is the bane of any actual practical business person's life. Still, Fiat adapts, as it always did, diversifying into all kinds of war machines as conflict engulfs the world. These include the M13 medium tank, the L3 tankette, and eventually a newly designed fleet of trucks that becomes the Italian standard for all battlefronts. Fiat provides a lot of vehicles. She not only provides vehicles to the Italians in North Africa, but she's also supplying the Japanese in Manchuria, Franco's forces in Spain, and even aircraft to China. It even provides air support to the Luftwaffe. What's often forgotten, of course, is that Italy had declared war in 1940. So one in 20 of those planes that, that came over Britain during the, the period of the Battle of Britain was actually Italian. American troops of General Patton's 7th Army move swiftly through western Sicily. More than 50,000 Axis prisoners surrender in the first three weeks of the campaign. As the war grinds on into 1943, the tables turn against Mussolini. Once again, 
The catalyst of this change is the Fiat workforce in Turin's war factories. By 1943, British and American aircraft are now getting in range of Italian factories, and they're bringing the war home. Heavy Allied raids have a devastating effect on factory workers. In March, there is a walkout staged at Mirafiori. They're protesting about the lack of danger money being paid while the Allies are bombing Turin and some 800 workers down tools and leave. Then spreads to become a general strike across Italy. 100,000 workers are out, which cuts at the very definition of what the fascist party was supposed to be about, about the average Italian working man, um, and thereby losing Mussolini even more credibility. And now that working man is blaming them for everything that's gone wrong, and Mussolini says that it has set them back 20 years. For Fiat and other Italian war factories, the situation grows increasingly dire as the bombing raids continue. They are incredibly intense. And, and one-fifth of the workforce simply abandons the factories. A lot of factory workers simply throw their tools down and run back to their villages to avoid being bombed. And you've got to remember that since Fiat is Italy's largest employer by a long way, the impact on Fiat's labour force is much greater than on any other. Food shortages are catastrophic as well. There's an estimate that Italian workers have lost something like, on average, 37 pounds of body weight. And you've got daily rations of less than 1,000 calories. You can't work on 1,000 calories, especially in a factory. The high tide of support for fascism had completely evaporated by 1943. You've got Mussolini's advisers actually saying to him, listen, the population are increasingly blaming the regime and not the enemy for the bombings. Facing an Allied invasion and growing civil unrest, Mussolini is finally deposed in July 1943. Not long afterwards, Italy surrenders. But Hitler has other ideas. Hitler is furious at what he believes that his allies have stabbed him in the back. So what he wants to do right away is go in and take over as much of Italy as he can and get Mussolini back into power. And what he does is to launch this incredibly daring commando raid. So he rescues Mussolini, probably the most unhappy man ever to be rescued, and he puts him in charge of a northern Italian republic. Fiat and the Turin area are now under Nazi occupation. And that, of course, is a really different beast to Mussolini's regime, because when the workers of Turin walk out in protest at this occupation, You've got an SS Brigadefuhrer, you know, almost an SS general who's now in charge, and he's going to respond in a very different way. And what he says is, right, use live rounds on the strikers. And what they do is they shoot the ringleaders and they deport a thousand others to labour camps in Germany. Agnelli now finds himself in an increasingly precarious position. At this point, Agnelli becomes an element in the German war economy. He has no autonomy. It's not like he can decide what to produce for the Italian army. Agnelli is between a rock and a hard place, frankly. He's a card-carrying member of the Italian Fascist Party, so what he can't really do is speak out against the regime. That's not going to work. Fiat's war factories are now at the whim of Hitler's Third Reich, and Agnelli is reduced to a mere puppet, his industrial empire torn from his grasp. For Fiat to survive, Agnelli must now take the biggest gamble of his life. He sees the way the wind is blowing, and he decides to throw his lot in with the resistance. Italian resistance fighters known as partisans revolt against the occupying Axis forces in a conflict that becomes known as the Italian Liberation War. So Agnelli and his right-hand man, Vittorio Valletta, what they start to do is they play this really dangerous double game. On the face of it, you've got Fiat. It, it's this loyal supporter of the fascist regime. It's supplying tanks and trucks and, and airplane engines to the Germans. But behind the scenes, Fiat's allegiance lies elsewhere. Fiat begin uh, supplying the partisans with weapons, providing interesting, important intelligence to American and British intelligence operations. Not so much, I think, because they love the Allies and want the Allies to win, but to prepare themselves for the post-World War that they are smart enough to know is coming. 
It's a plan which has two elements. One is to save your own skin. But secondly, if you can think grander, it's to keep control of your industry, to keep control of your money. But like all double games, you know, let's not underestimate this at all. This is really dangerous. Had the Germans found out, about this, it could have gone very badly for Fiat. The Germans are not in a compromising mood in 1943, 44, 45. Uh, however, if you don't cooperate at all with the Allies, you're probably taking a greater risk. When the war ends in 1945, the gamble pays off. In May 1945, the letter is put on trial for collaborating with the Nazis, but Valletta is absolutely ready. What Valletta, always the master of detail, does is provide detailed chapter and verse of just how much money Agnelli and himself and the firm had channeled to the Italian resistance uh, in and after 1943, and that wins the Allies over. By July 1946, the Allies have reinstated Valletta as the head of Fiat and are pumping money into the company to keep it afloat. Giovanni Agnelli isn't so lucky. The letter, you know, could basically escape his fascist association, but for Agnelli, it was a bit more problematic. Agnelli is always going to be an ambivalent figure. Everyone remembered how close he was to Mussolini from 1922 onwards. He's very much yesterday's man. He was placed under house arrest, and he actually dies on the 16th of December 45, still very much tainted by his dealings with Il Duce. The mantle then passes to Valletta to take his legacy forward. Valletta more than repays that trust and successfully turns Fiat's war factories back to car production. Valletta's regency is very successful. Fiat enjoy a marvellous resurgence in the 1950s, um, producing some of the most iconic cars of the century. So by 57, just 12 years after the end of the war, Fiat's production has magnified tenfold. And, you know, it's, it's one of Italy's main employers once again. For 20 years, Valletta oversees Fiat's growing fortunes. Valletta's last great act, a piece de resistance. He reintroduces the Fiat 500, you know, the kind of iconic Cinquecento. That's one of the best known of, of all Fiat cars. A beautifully styled, tiny car. It's an instant classic and a, and a huge success. And then by the time the Cinquecento has finished its run in 75, it's sold 3.6 million models. Agnelli's grandson, Gianni Agnelli, takes over the business in 1966, building Fiat into a force within Italy once again. Just how much of a force can be seen from a small incident that took place 30 years later. In summer 1993, a political professor named Giolano Urbani produced this uh, piece of work that said that the next Italian government would be run by the Italian Communist Party. And it catches the eye of one Gianni Agnelli, who calls him to Fiat for a meeting. And Agnelli is incredibly wary of the communists, because obviously they are played a part in his grandfather's downfall at the end of the Second World War. A few days later, Urbani gets a telephone call from Silvio Berlusconi, and he says, uh, I hear from Agnelli that you have something interesting to show me. Within a year of that meeting, Berlusconi forms Forza Italia, and Urbani becomes a minister in his first government. So it just goes to show you that even 100 years on, Fiat is still playing a leading role in Italian politics. 